Okay, Roger once again, Mud Fossil University, and I am today going to discuss the different tissues in the body and their affinity for transition metals. And transition metals create these colors. Blue is, a, you know, turquoise or whatever color you want to call it, the brown, the reds, the blues. Those are yellows and oranges and reds, and I mean, they're all the different colors of the transition metals. And I will show you this, and this is extremely important, and it has just shown up as extremely, extremely important because of a study on aluminum and the tissues that uh, are, are um, invaded by aluminum. So we're going to go into that, and it causes, um, well, I'm not saying it causes, but it, it, there seems to be a high incidence of high levels of aluminum in autism. And that was apparently shown by this study. I know the people that are going to Mud Fossil University up on uh, YouTube I must be sick of this uh, stuff about transition metals, but it's still not well understood. And these are the same colors that we just saw in that heart. All right, so you can see those colors in that heart were in exactly specific locations. They weren't just here and there, a glob here, a glob there. The certain tissues want to be associated to certain metals. And that's, you see these plus threes and twos and all that business? All that means is it's, it's saying, hey, I, in, in, a certain, in a certain pH, these things change. They transition. They transition. And that's what they do in your body. And you need these, but you can't have them in such excessive quantities that they interfere with other exchanges. And apparently this is what's happening with the aluminum. And I will show you why I say that. I say apparently, I'm just guessing. I don't know this. But somebody should look at it. Because they're not really even looking at these metals. They think these are just trace elements in your body. And that is just so far from correct. It's in, in, unbelievable. What happens is these here are what they call metal complexes, and they associate to other different things. They tag along. They're the thing in the middle, and they grab a whole bunch of stuff around them with what they call ligands. And the ligands have a charge on them, whether it's positive or negative, and it will pick up and give or pick up things. That's how you deliver and pick up things in your body. That's what these do, and bacteria create these. So I, I've been harping and harping and harping. I'm sorry. But I just have to keep saying it because people are apparently not listening. And, and, and I'm not saying I'm right. I'm not saying I'm a hero on this. Oh, I know everything about this. No, I don't. I'm as close to getting to something as anybody has. If you don't look at it, you don't see it. That's just all. That's, that's all I'm saying. And, and this is what I've been running into. An absolute refusal to look at anything that seems to make sense. That's my point. I just can't understand it. But... We are where we are. So I'm going to show you why I say these things. All right, this is a, um, a paper by um, people that are considered as experts in this field. And they have resources. I have no, no resources these people have. So they're talking about human health and the risk and the, of aluminum, aluminum oxide, and aluminum hydrogen, hydro, hydroxide. Now, and then they talk about, here's where I'm coming in from this. Now, just listen, I'm going to read it, and, and I know that it's going to be a little techie, but just don't, don't worry about it. Just think, open your mind up a little bit for a second, because there's a point here that um, I could probably just cut to, but let me just read it to you. A compendium is provided of aluminum compounds used in industrial settings. They're worried about what you're going to get from the industry. Pharmaceutical, food additives, cosmetics, and, and a lot of them are worried about um, uh, vaccines because they put them in vaccines too. Now, most aluminum compounds are solids exhibiting high melting points, and but, 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 here we go. The solubility of aluminum salts is governed by the pH, what I was just talking before. Solubility of aluminum salts, that's what we're dealing with in your body, aluminum salts. They're not like chunks of aluminum, all right? And it's governed by the pH, that's what creates the transition. Because the aluminum 3 cation, which is, you see, Al3+, has a strong affinity for hydroxide ion. This is probably going to bore you. Anyway, it goes on, in most situations, seek out complex agents. That is the metal complexes with oxygen atom donor sites such as a carboxylate. This is what I've been screaming at, carboxylation. They move things through your body, carboxylation, and it never stops in wet conditions. Even when bodies are dead and they're turning to rock, carboxylation continues. It will never, ever, ever, ever stop.
And that's why C14 dating, I don't believe, is ever going to be accurate. So let's go on with this. So it says such sites as carboxylate and phosphate groups, including in biological systems. And then it goes on about aluminum oxides, hydroxides, and uh, oxyhydroxides occur in numerous crystallographic forms. All right? That means they, they crystal, crystals attach in different polarities to things, which exhibit different surface properties. That means the polarities. They say per surface properties. That means whether it has a positive or negative, and then they have call it dipole moments, and there's all kinds of things like this. But what it boils down to is that particular oxide, that particular um, group here, carboxylate, is going to go and attach to things. Now, if it's excessive, maybe it'll attach to things it shouldn't. Maybe it's going to do things and block things. Maybe it's going to interfere with all kinds of things. Maybe it's going to, going to create problems in the actual electrical system of your body. I don't know what the, the, because I don't think they know what it is. They just say if there's a lot of it, you're in trouble. And I don't know, I would like to know what it actually does. Why, why does it cause a problem? Is it blocking something else being like magnesium or something wants to come in? I don't know. I have no idea. But we could probably see in some of these tissues the colors that are in them that will say, well, I'm supposed to be blue here. Like you saw in the heart, there was heart strings supposed to be blue. If those were orange, well, maybe the guy's got a problem with uh, magnesium. But these things are, should be looked at. These are, are clues, and they're just not being looked at as clues. They're being uh, avoided. So that's just on my point. Anyway, so that's, that's the reason that I say that these particular things that are in your body are important, and they, and they should be monitored, and they should be looked at, and they should be more carefully scrutinized. Because I'm going to show you the percentages that were in these people that have these conditions. And it was extremely high, apparently. All right, this was an autism study. I'm just going to read you what it says. Out of five people uh, in this particular uh, section of the study, all four male donors had significantly higher concentrations of brain aluminum than the single female donor. We recorded some of the highest values for brain aluminum content ever measured in healthy or diseased tissues in these male ASD donors, including values of 17, 10, 18, 0. 0.57, and 22. Normally one is uh, what it should be. Now, uh, what discriminates these data from other analysis of brain aluminum in others is the age of the, of the um, ASD donors. Uh, so it says, why would a 15-year-old boy have such a high concentration of aluminum? Like it didn't, it's not adding and adding and adding. Somehow it got put in there or he's involved in some area where it, it, it's being ingested or some reason that this kid or person is, is, is getting these high levels of aluminum in such an early stage. Uh, they say there is no other comparative data in the scientific literature close as being similarity high data for a 42-year-old male with familial Alzheimer's disease. So this is this this leads to two different things you have to think about. First of all, is the the, the amount of aluminum is exceptionally high, and in, in a young donor, in a young person, and secondly, you have to understand that this is familiar. Alzheimer's. So this guy's 42 and he has the same kind of high concentration. He's getting brain dysfunction with Alzheimer's. As we know, it's a devastating disease. And this is familial. So there's something in the chemistry of that person's body that wants to get aluminum. Now, maybe there's a way just to make that person do what they call chelation. It's spelled with a C-H. I call it chelation. And they, and they go in and they actually get uh, some injections of different chemistry that goes in and wants to find aluminum, attaches to it, and it flushes it out. If they can reduce their aluminum levels, it, it, I, I would assume that it is going to reverse their condition or at least mitigate it in some form have some effect on it. Let me put it that way. So, 
they should introduce something. They should try at least make some tests on this and check it out. I've seen a lot of st people saying that chelation can actually re completely uh, eliminate autism and completely actually uh, uh, multiple sclerosis too, because that I think is a high level of iron. They're finding out all this stuff that's been sort of pushed under the table, and I don't know why, because it's... The, this is research. It, just, it should be research. Research is research. You don't search once and then it's done. No, research. We are researching because the search, I don't think, was adequately done. And I would like to see these transition metals adequately studied. And the levels in a, a high number of, of people and to get a baseline of the average and then what associated conditions to uh, um, anomalies in certain metals, and then what bacteria are present in what guts that, that control these metals. Are some bacteria missing, that, and then now the metal's missing? These are the kind of things that should be understood, because the, the bacteria and the transition metals in your body, and what you put into your body for these things to work on, are the key to your health. Not the other things that they inject into your body and they tell you to eat and to antibiotics go and kill all the things they're trying to make you healthy. There's a, there's a disconnect in the reality of your, how your body works and how the metals in your body do their job and how the bacteria in your body provide the metals to do the job. And I think that if you are healthy and your metals are correct in your body and the chemistry of your body works and knows how to transfer things, how to pick things up, and how to deal with the things that are in your body and it doesn't have any restrictions on it and, and things blocking it and things holding it back and things destroying and killing the things that make the things that make you healthy, then I think you're going to be healthy. Just as we'll go with the earth. Go as close to the earth as you can get. Don't worry about bacteria coming out of the earth. That stuff really, I don't think, is anything that's really going to hurt you. Bacteria coming out of some crazy things, well, maybe. I mean, there's bacteria in the earth, I know, and there's all kinds of things that can hurt you. But if you if you have good, clean, healthy soils, and, and uh, you're not putting feces in there and all that kind of stuff, and it, it, the, the chemistry is right in there, and it, you're going to be healthy. You're going to be healthy. I'm telling you, that's just a fact. And, and, uh, and, and the things we are eating, the things we're putting in our body, the things that we're allowing to be uh, used for our health, are, are, I don't think are, are really doing as much as we think they are. And it's, I certainly think that this study, and I'm doing my own here, because I have, here's, here's the story. I have the mud fossils, and these mud fossils are certified, they're DNA proven, and I can see the chemistry that's inside them, and I can see where the transition metals are. are, are um, well, here, hold on a second. Okay, this is a transition metal, um, something easily for you to see. You see the red, the very bright red and the black? That's the vein, and, you know, the artery on the left, the vein on the right. And then the transition metals bond with the tissues as it, it is flushed into the toe. And I know it's been flushed into the toe because, first of all, the different colors of all the transition metals that accumulated here. And secondly, you see the gold and the heavy metals have accumulated in the toe. And thirdly, you can see the blood has gushed out of the toe in the front. And that is actually blood congealed on the bottom of the toe. This is, um, this is the guy's callus right there. This is a big toe. That's a callus, and that's uh, the left, uh, actually I guess that would be the right big toe. And, and, and if you showed this to a geologist, they would say that that came out of a volcano or something. Now, this is another, um, this is a finger, and you see the blood gushed out of the, the arterial side of that fingertip. And that's where you get garnets from. Garnets come in every color because as the blood comes out, it, it, it changes um, the uh, intensity of the metals that are in the blood. The very bright red um, garnets are the first blood. Now you see all the blood has congealed down here, all that little scabby looking stuff. That is, is um, what happens with blood. It, it, um, it, it gets surrounded by, it forms metal complexes, gets surrounded and sequestered and, and preserved. And that's what, why mud fossils are so good. And it only happens in wet environments. And uh, you can see on the very end, see to the left there, that little 
dimple there, the little brown dimple, that's actually the valve. Uh, well, the, uh, what they call it? Yeah, vein valves. It's the valve on the left, and on the right, that little white dot is where the artery was. And those blow out in these heavily aqueous solutions. And up in here, you see all the crystals that form? That is the nature of the chemistry of the body. And here's, I believe, this was a lung. You can see the big red nasty spot there from the uh, blood. And, uh, and I, I soaked these. Uh, I'll show you that in a second. I think I have this stuff around here. Yes, I do. Now, this is what happens. All mud fossils that are in these wet conditions that petrify in flood conditions, and then that leaches out most of the uh, volatile organics, and then as they dry out, they continue to carboxylate, which is get rid of all of the... Uh, the carbon moves in and gets rid of everything, and they try to get into a state just like this. They go into a quartz state, crystal quartz. But the blood stays. And it's all from moving around these metals, and and, uh, and that's why carbox uh, C14 doesn't going to ever work, I don't think. Now, this is, as you can see, a lung that's cut in half. And you see all these different pockets of this and that in there and all the stuff in between. They think that's sediments. They just dr drilled out of the Chicxulub. Um, crater down in uh, Mexico and they think this is all the stuff they're pulling out is this, it's from lungs I'm just telling you that's a fact, you can do whatever you want with it, think whatever you want to think, that's a lung too and you see all these little things, all those little tiny spots and uh, are little pockets of the lung and they to me I think there's a lot of different chemistry in even the little pockets separately of your lung so to just to recap everything, you got autism, which has an extremely high level of one of the transition metals, aluminum. And we know that the transition metals are in the blood. And we know that they uh, are collect in somebody that has a, uh, a familial um, affinity to, to, to pass that on to their offspring, apparently as that Alzheimer's thing thought. So anyway, what I'm getting at is if somebody did the study of all of these different variants, what is the bacteria, what is the blood, and what is the uh, uh, fecal matter? You know, well, anyways, you're going to get you're going to get your bacteria, I would assume, from a fecal sample. You're going to get your um, blood work from your blood chemistry. You just find out what kind of metals are in there, in their percentages. And that's it. And then if you associate that to the conditions that, that these people have. You don't have to have any special names. You just have to have conditions, blood work, and, the, and the bacteria. And before long, you will draw associations to what diseases are associated to what missing bacteria or excessive metals or lack of metals. It's, 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 a, it's a balancing act. It's a chemistry set. That's how the stuff doesn't just bump around your body accidentally. I mean, there's a lot more to it than they take into the diet. It's the main thing of everything. But that's just, I'm just talking. So that's my point. I think it should be looked at. That's DNA tested. That's a human lung. DNA tested. 100% human. All right. and I have all kinds of tested fossils here. So, And I know the, the chemistry is in there. See, that is another human lung. Well, I don't know if it's human, but it, this was never DNA tested. But the blood, the red and the black blood, is running out from this lung. And that's what they do. They fossilize and they petrify in that manner. That's the chemistry of it. All right, so that's all I can say. I'd like to see something happen that would be um, positive in the health arena because uh, I think it's mostly just diet. I really do. I really do. And, and I think this can be handled very, very, very easily. Very easily.